Good evening, everyone. I'm Brett Long, curator of Mammals and Birds at the Aquarium Pacific, and I'd like to welcome all of you, those of you in person and online, to our first Wednesday's program on killer whales of California. Our guest speaker this evening is Elisa Schulman Janiger. Her presentation will be about 45 minutes long, followed by audience question and answer, and afterwards will be followed by a cocktail and social hour with music in the Great Hall and paint to fish in our art gallery. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Courtyard by Marriott Long Beach Downtown, Stephen and Brenda Olson, Ralph and Hazel Osborne, and the Lois Rourke Charitable Trust. We'd also like to thank our volunteers this evening for helping out with this event and with the question and answers. If you've not already done so, please take a minute now to silence your cell phones. And we'd also like to remind our guests to please keep your face masks on over your mouth throughout the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Elisa Schulman Janiger is a marine biologist, cetacean researcher, and educator. She is a research associate at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. She has been the director and coordinator of the American Cetacean Society's LA Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project since 1984, and is an instructor for the Cabrillo Whale Watch Program. Elisa is co-founder of the California Killer Whale Project and is their lead research biologist. She's been photo identifying California killer whales, archiving sightings, and studying distribution, natural history, and behavior for over 40 years. She is a naturalist on whale watching boats, a photographer specializing in cetacean photo ID, and a responder for the whale entanglement response team. Elisa taught marine biology and marine science in San Pedro High School for 21 years, and she has co-authored, or so, sorry, authored and co-authored many papers and presentations on whales in this area. Welcome, Elisa. Thank you so much, and thanks for inviting me here tonight. So my passion I found pretty early is killer whales. I was a little kid, loved going to the beach. My parents took me to the beach a lot and I'd be playing with the little fish, the grunion. Didn't know what they were, but they were really cute. Decided to raise them, take them home. Parents weren't really a fan of that. And I kept doing that throughout the years for different projects. When I was 12 years old, I was, had a literally in the school library holding a book on dolphins in one hand and a book on chimpanzees in the other because that's sort of the way my two interests were going to study animals that have very rich emotional lives live for a long time decided it's kind of hard for a california girl to study chimpanzees wild ones in california so i better go towards cetaceans started out with bottlenose dolphin and quickly became very enamored of killer whales as long as i could remember so a lot of the photographs I'm including today, almost all of them are mine, and I shoot most of them here in Southern California, but I do a lot of my work up in Monterey Bay. We've got collaborators up there with our California Killer Whale Project, and that's where killer whales go in the springtime, and that's where we do a lot of our research. But we also do see them here. Have any of you seen killer whales here in Southern California? Anybody? Yes, there are wild killer whales in our own backyard. Not every day, I sure wish. But I'll share some of those with you. Uh, this one, I actually want to go back to this uh, one picture right there. This was December 23rd, 2013, had, and I remember dates really well. Not good with names, which is hard for a classroom teacher, no longer in the classroom. But these two killer whales are two of my favorites. They're from the CA-51 family, that's CA-51 star and her daughter, CA-51E comet. And they were spy hopping looking down in the little boat I was in. Did not know they had made a kill of a common dolphin. I saw that later in my pictures. But after a kill, they get real curious and real social with each other and sometimes with boats too. In this particular family we call the friendly pod because they've done that so often. They're the ones you're most likely to see in Southern California. So killer whales are the top predators, Orsinus orca. A lot of people call them orcas. A lot of scientists don't because the common name for killer whale is killer whale. Orsinus is the first part of their scientific name. 
I call bottlenose dolphin Terciops, which is the first part of their scientific name. The uh, tendency is to call them by their first name, their genus name. And killer whales would then be Orsinus. So a lot of people don't call them orcas because that's the second name that wouldn't be following protocol. But it's become more and more popular because um, killer whales don't kill people, killer sharks kill people, killer tigers kill people, kill people, but they are the killers of whales, particularly off California, not all killer whales. They are the most widely distributed mammal in the world. They're found in every single ocean. Their coloration is a combination of black and white called disruptive contrast. So a prey item would see only floating blobs of white in the water and wouldn't really see the black part. Very streamlined shape. They have a single blowhole like all dolphins or adonocetes, tooth whales. A tall dorsal fin that's taller in adult males can get to be four and a half to six foot high in an adult male, about two and a half foot in a female. A thick blubber layer underneath which streamlines them and gives them extra energy. Powerful flukes for pushing along in the water. Specialized circulatory system, broad flippers, males flippers are a lot bigger and their flukes are also bigger and curved down. Very efficient lungs and a lot of sharp teeth. The melon in their head helps focus sound. They do echolocation. They could tell blindfolded the difference between a rubber ball and a steel ball from quite a distance away. And they need to be able to do that in order to find their prey and figure out exactly what they want to be eating. They do have a small beak. They have a highly variable eye patch, which in some types of killer whales is barely there, and other types is actually huge. So the newborns are kind of orangey in color. We're not really sure why. That's one of the mysteries that maybe they have less blubber and it's blood vessels showing through. Maybe it's because they have some sort of jaundice, and scientists are still arguing about that. So we don't have all the answers. People think that we, that we do. They are sexually dimorphic, which means boys look different from girls. At birth, they look pretty much the same, unless you look on the underside. Adult males are larger, and they weigh more. They vary between 22 and 32 feet long, depending upon the kind of killer whale. There are different types. And most likely, there's different species of killer whale that we haven't yet separated into species, maybe as many as 10 different species. Get to be 8 to 11 tons. They have taller dorsal fins, and their fins start to grow or sprout when they're somewhere between 8 and 13 years old, uh, sometimes not until they're 16. So in some cases, you don't know. If you have a son or daughter, they probably do, but we wouldn't know if it's a male or female until the fin starts to sprout for a male, until the female gives birth, or until either one turns over and we get a belly shot because they're actually a different color on the underside. Males are mama's boys. If you see a male and female swimming together, it's almost always a female and her son. Males stay with their moms, almost all males, for their whole lives. Why females, for most of our killer whales out here, the mammal eaters, because they need to have small groups in order to sneak up on mammals, most of the females will leave their mother and form their own pod after they've had one or two kids. But they come back for visits a lot, Christmas, New Year's, and hang out with the family. You get big family celebrations with everybody visiting and showing off the grandbabies. Kind of know what that's like. If a mom dies, males really suffer terribly. They're used to staying with their mom. Sometimes they get adopted by another female. And that's true in different kinds of killer whales. We've seen that. And locally, we have an example of that. Females are smaller and weigh less. They get to be about 15 foot long, four to eight tons, and they have smaller dorsal fins. Gestation, they're pregnant for about, well, you guys might think nine months is a lot, but imagine 15 to 18 months pregnant, long time. The birth is usually tail first, but sometimes it's head first. Females can have up to seven calves in a lifetime two, three, every two or three years, or sometimes five years between calves. The earliest they generally give birth is somewhere around 15, but we've had some local ones, a few that have given birth at age 12 or 13. And uh, they can give birth into their early 40s. Usually it goes in a lot similar to our life cycle, our reproductive cycle. They become, they're really fertile about age 20, 25, and then fertility drops off. The youngest mom was actually seven years old, which means she got pregnant when she was five or six. So she was a little kid, was in captivity. She didn't know what to do with the kid. 
abandon it. How are you supposed to nurse? It's like a five or six year old human giving birth. And then she got pregnant again and again didn't know what to do. In the wild, we, uh, about 10 is the oldest, is the youngest mom. Oldest mom um, population is probably about 42 or 43, but in a northern resident population of fish eaters was 48 years old or so. High calf mortality, there's very high calf mortality. A lot of them lose their first calf, particularly southern residents. Females live longer than males, maybe up to 80 or 100 years old. Males, maybe 30 to 60. And they actually go through menopause. They're one of the few mammals besides humans that does, along with false killer whales, long finned pilot whales, belugas, and narwhals. Their matriarchal, again, females lead the group. They nurse their calves for between one and five years. The milk's about 30% butterfat, ours is about 2% or so. And it changes as the calf develops. But the milk can harbor pollutants. The milk is made from fat. And if you've been eating polluted food that gets stored in fat, like DDT and PCBs, chemical pollutants, that, fire retardants that can get passed on to your kid, it could be fatal. Put down on fertility and their immune system. So how do you tell a boy from a girl? Well, if they turn upside down, it's always exciting when that happens. You can see the differences here. The male's got a longer genital slit there. And there are some examples of boys and girls. So it's very exciting when a little calf turns upside down and um, you get to know from the very beginning if it's a boy or girl. Again, imagine if you are a human, you had to wait 10 years to find out if you had a son or daughter. But again, they would know. And this is Comet, in my, one of my little favorites. She was one year old when she suddenly breached next to her mom, showed me her belly. Of course, she wasn't showing it to me. She was just doing that, and I saw it, got a picture, and I knew she was a girl. So exciting. She has two black mammary spots. Now, occasionally males have black mammary spots. Might be interesting if a little calf tries to nurse from that. And occasionally females don't, but almost always that's what they look like. Oh, hold on a second. A little bit of a delay here. If you put it back up. OK. And they have a super sense echolocation when they can find their prey using sound. They have a hollow lower jaw, and the sound waves bounce back through fluid-filled jaw and to their ears. High frequency gives more detail, and low frequency travels further away. So I run a gray whale census at Point Vicente, and this is important for the killer whale story, because I started the full-time a Gray Wall Census and Behavior Project. Everybody's invited to come visit us at Point Vicente. Be there at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, counting whales. And back on January 29th, 1984, Carl Etel, one of our main whale watchers, called me, and I'd been dreaming about killer whales all night long, like four or five different dreams about killer whales. He woke up and said, we have killer whales. At that time, we were watching from marine land. I'm half asleep, and I said, of course you have killer whales. You're in marine land. And he said, no, wild killer whales, right up close to us, super close. And I called my friend Bob Talbot, and we went out in an inflatable, and we actually found those killer whales. We went up to boats and said, anyone see the killer whales? And they all pointed and followed the trail of people. And we heard on the radio, first they pulled the lips out, and then they ate the tongue. So we knew we were on the right course because people had seen those killer whales. So we see lots of different marine mammals at Point Vicente and in our waters off here. Killer whales are our largest dolphin right here. But we've also seen gray whales. There are gray whales. We counted five of them today from Point Vicente. Blue whales, fin whales, humpback whales, sperm whales. We had sperm whales two years ago uh, yesterday. Minke whales. Uh, We've had common dolphin, both long-beaked and short-beaked, rhesus dolphin, doll's porpoise, bottlenose dolphin, Pacific white-sided dolphin, elephant seals, harbor seals, California sea lions, sea otters, and more. So we have many kinds of species we could see there. So this is back from January 29, 1984, when I'm out on the water with Bob, and we went and got to see the killer whales right out here. And picture from a boat of us taking pictures of the whales. So for many years, this is a, what I thought you generally see. Killer whales out here It was what I ended up calling the L.A. pod because we saw them all the time off L.A. They were the only killer whales we saw close to shore between 1982 and 1997. If you've ever heard of the whale that ate jaws, it was one of these. 
really small whales. I thought that was normal. The first time I saw a mammal eater, it looked like a giant to me because I was used to these really sort of pocket-sized whales. Today, we're much more likely to see the CA-51s. They're mammal eaters. We didn't see them south of Santa Barbara till May 2007. Before that, they were seen in the Channel Islands. They're seen up in uh, Monterey. We had mom in the early 1990s. But if you see killer whales out here, chances are pretty good it's that family, but we could see multiple different families in our area. And they're coming and checking out the boat, which the CA-51s like doing that a lot. So killer whales of California, most often we see the big transient killer whales off here. We also see another type of killer whale called offshore killer whales that specialize in eating sharks. We've been seeing them since 1992 in California, come down from British Columbia in groups of up to 100. And we've never seen them attack mammals, but we have seen them check gray whales out while they were mating, and the gray whales didn't mind, so somehow they knew it wasn't dangerous. The elipods, most likely from the eastern tropical Pacific, they've been seen all the way from the Farallon Islands to the Bay of LA in the Sea of Cortez. We have not seen them since December 4th, 1997. So they're sort of my holy grail. I would love to see them again. Southern residents don't get down to our area, but we have seen them down in Monterey. And we also see some whales that we can't yet link to any other type. We call them, the, uh, well, we refer to them as pelagic killer whales or sometimes the sperm whale eaters. Uh, pretty mysterious. So we're interested in collecting life history, everything about killer whales, particularly their photos and follow them through the years through photography. So everything we do builds on things that other people have done before us. In my case, Ken Balcom is a huge uh, mentor. He's one of our advisors for the California Killer Whale Project. Uh, he's a good friend of mine and gone up to visit him and gone out and seen Southern residents and transients uh, of Puget Sound quite a few times. My very first wild killer whale was actually J2 Granny, pretty famous. She was somewhere between probably 85 and 100 years old when she died. Uh, I saw her from shore, from water. Um, she's not with us anymore, but uh, she was a huge inspiration. Mike Big was what, sort of the father of killer whale research, pioneered identifying different killer whales by the shape of their fin. And he actually came to my house and gave me hints on how to study killer whales when I was just starting out, which is really cool. And uh, there's me on a very happy day in Monterey Bay, my, one of my very happy places, watching killer whales. Dennis Kelly collected killer whale sightings and talked about sending in pictures. And uh, he was a huge inspiration. And he ended up bequeathing all of the work he had collected to me, which formed a good part of the basis of our uh, first California killer whale catalog. It's a professor at Orange Coast College. And a whale we kept looking for was, he called Old Sloughfin. CA-64 was one of his favorites there. So this is our first catalog. We're working on updating this now. Killer Whales of California and Western Mexico, a catalog of photo-identified individuals with my colleagues uh, Nancy Black, Richard Chanello, and Mercedes. And uh, I've been working with Nancy for a long time. She's up in Monterey. An interesting story about how we met. We were at a marine mammal conference, and we had a break in speakers. There were about 400 people at that conference back in 1987. And she sat down on a bench outside of a room, and I sat down next to her to eat a little pastry. She took out a slide box and looked at them, and I looked over her shoulder, and they were killer whales. And I said, ooh, ooh, killer whales. She said, yeah, I just saw my first killer whales. And she was studying Pacific white-sided dolphin. And I took a look, and it was the killer, our LA pod from here. So excited. So that was the, be the beginning, the happenstance of two people out of 450 sitting on the same bench as the person pulls out a slide, and then I recognize it. That was crazy. But life is full of these interesting connections. So our California Killer Whale Project is now a nonprofit. Our mission is to continue the long-term study of ecology, natural history, and conservation of killer whales off California. And Nancy and I are the co-founders of this. And we have our colleagues, Colleen, Tomoko, and Bradley. And we do most of our work up in Monterey, but we are interested in sightings of killer whales throughout California and knowing where those whales go. If you have any uh, pictures of killer whales, any sightings to contribute, um, I'll give you you have, uh, I'll give you my email, but in particular, we have our California killer whale Gmail right here. You can send those in, those encounters in. 
Those are like gold to us. It gives us a little piece of the life history of the different whales. California Killer Whale Project at gmail.com. We love to see them. If they've been sitting around for 15, 20 years, we don't care. So there's many kinds of killer whales, as I said. The North Pacific, there's about 2,500, we think. Antarctica, about 25,000. And worldwide, there might be as many as 100,000 killer whales. The uh, people ask how deep thing in they dive. One killer whale dove to over 3,500 feet and stayed down at 12 minutes as she grabbed a, um, an arc toothfish off of a line. So these are all different kinds of killer whales, different shapes a little bit, different colorations, different eye patches. And we could tell by looking at killer whales what form of killer whale it is, what kind it might be. For example, the southern residents are the ones we don't have here. They're the ones that are highly endangered, critically endangered. There's only 72 or 73 of them. They spend a lot of their time in Puget Sound. But they're just not getting enough fish up there. And they had a big problem with contaminants, with pollution, P PCBs in particular up there. So for the southern residents, the saddle, the gray area behind the dorsal fin, is a really important ID marker for us. It's sometimes open, which means it has black pigment in, in it. The prey is fish, particularly Chinook salmon. Over 80, 85% of their diet is Chinook salmon. The, they uh, spend in the summer up in Puget Sound, but not as much as they used to, difficulty finding that salmon. Group size is between 10 and 40, typically. They vocalize a lot. The salmon don't swim away when they hear a killer whale. The transients are the ones we see now most often, the, uh, the uh, CA-51s, for example. And uh, their dorsal fin tends to be more pointy. The resident's dorsal fin is more curved in the front. Their saddles tend to be very large and white and closed. They don't have black intrusions very much. They love to eat mammals, and they practice on birds. You wouldn't think there's a lot of food in birds, but it's great practice, particularly for the kids. So we've seen them eat several species of seabirds. Group size from three to 10, the most we've seen on one day in one area, feeding associated with gray whale, was 50 different killer whales. Out of a population, we think it's just over 200. That was a lot of families gathered that day. They're very quiet when they're hunting, and then they get really chatty after they've caught something while they're attacking it, and then afterwards when they're socializing. The offshore type killer whales have a really rounded tip dorsal fin. They tend to have a smaller saddle, which occasionally has intrusions in it, the black areas. They love sharks. They love to eat sharks and they love fish. LA pod also ate sharks and ate sea lions. They, their range is unpredictable. We tend to see them more in the fall, winter, and spring, not so much the summer. They spend more time, we think, up in British Columbia up there. The group size is typically somewhere 12, uh, 25 to 40, but they can be in groups of 100 or more. There's about 300 or so of them. And they vocalize, they're very chatty, and they tend to do the same kind of behavior, uh, spreading out in subpods, sometimes over 10 miles. Imagine 100 killer whales out here, which we actually had February 11th, 1995, and they were spread out between half a mile out and 11 miles out. They all moved together, they all stopped together, they all visited together, even though they're spread out that long distance. They keep in touch acoustically. The other thing they like to do is lob tail a lot. They like to slap their tail a lot. I don't know why, they didn't tell me, but it's really cool. And other kinds of killer whales we see that aren't official ecotypes, these pelagic offshore ones usually, but we can't connect them yet to our transient killer whales, but they do seem to specialize in mammals. A lot of them tend to have these, not all, these cookie cutter shark bites or small bioluminescent sharks that come up, take a bite out and one bite go away. And they've done it from people and submarines and all sorts of things, whales. And uh, they, the, they have known to prey on mammals, on sperm whales, fin whales, rhesus dolphin. Many of them, we've only had one sighting of them, so we don't know a lot about them. Group size is variable, and so far they're not connected to transients. How do we tell if they're connected, a part of the same population? One is if we see like a transient swimming with an unknown whale, they only swim with each other to our knowledge, so that makes the other whale transient. Or if we get a recording, they have certain dialects, they have pass on their language and their habits through culture, and we could tell that way too. Many of the cases we didn't have that. Eastern Tropical Pacific just means they're from San Diego south to Peru. 
that it's like saying you live in Europe, what do you eat? People ask me all the time, what do ETPs eat? Well, they could eat ray or they could eat whale or dolphin and which family are you talking about? We, we're still learning a lot about them. They tend to have very dark or almost uh, saddles which almost aren't there. Uh, their range goes from, we've, well, we've seen them, actually, these guys, we've actually seen up uh, off of uh, Catalina, and we've had them off of um, Santa Barbara once. The group size is variable also, and they tend to have uh, certain barnacles on their dorsal fin, which is interesting in the last 10 or 15 years, our transients are getting more of these barnacles on them. We think they're more tropical related, may have something to do with the warmer water, getting a lot more warmer water. And our LA pod, which we think are most likely from the Eastern Tropical Pacific, since they were actually seen in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And then they came up and stayed here a lot for 15 years. This is a graphic that kind of shows where the different uh, group types of killer whales might be found. You can see that residence. The yellow goes all the way across into Russia. Our transients go all the way along the coast. Our offshore killer whales tend to be offshore, but I have seen them from shore. They're not always offshore. And the whales from the eastern tropical Pacific are seen mostly south of us. And then those uh, sperm whale hunters or pelagic whales aren't always seen offshore. We had some just uh, last month really uh, cl fairly close to shore in Monterey Bay, but there's a deep water canyon there. So they can be pretty close to shore and still be in deep water. Transients are likely a separate species. They, we think they've been separated for over 750,000 years from uh, other ecotypes, from the residents, for example. Here's some examples of some of our transients. There's CA20, who's been photographed all the way from uh, Malibu up to Alaska. Four of our, set of our transients were seen together in 1989 up in Alaska likely all related, part of the same family. He was with CA54, the female on the right there, who is most likely his mom. We don't know for sure because we didn't see him as a calf with her. But since they're uh, very tightly associated, always seen with each other, and one of their eye patches looks really similar too, we think there's some family stuff going on there. So I wouldn't at all be surprised. He's probably at least 55. Their fins are fully grown when they're about 20. And she's probably at least 65 years old. Females have their first calf at about uh, age 10, but they can have calves when they're 20 or 30 or 40. So she could be 65, 75, 85, or 95. We just don't know. CA-10 is still around. He's been seen to Vancouver Island. And CA-217, or Chopfin, is a whale we used to see a lot here. Hasn't been seen since 2015. He's most likely gone. He was caught in an entanglement, which messed his fin up. And then he was run over, apparently, by a boat, which also messed his fin up. But he was one that we saw here fairly frequently. He liked to eat harbor seals in Monterey Bay. So some of their prey, gray whales seasonally, particularly April and May, harbor seal, California sea lion, harbor porpoise, northern elephant seal, common dolphin, particularly in Southern California. I suspect a lot might come down here to eat our common dolphin. We have a lot of them, sometimes 10,000 on one day. So there's plenty of those around. Both long and short beak common dolphin, Pacific white-sided dolphin, particularly up in Monterey Bay. Also, uh, minke whales, though not as frequently, fin whales, sperm whales, doll's porpoise, which we don't see too often here, rhesus dolphin, which are actually pretty big for a killer whale to eat, but we've only documented a handful of times in California. Bottlenose dolphin, we only have one confirmed um, predation on that. And we know they do go after uh, humpback whales and blue whales, but we've never actually seen a predation a kill in California. This humpback whale is nicknamed black rakes for the killer whale tooth marks on it. They do attack humpback whale calves in Mexico that's where, and also in Australia when they're only a couple weeks old. And blue whales, uh, seem, they also, both of these have had tooth marks on their tail and on their dorsal fin. So we have seen them harass blue whales, particularly in Monterey Bay in uh, 2014. On Monterey Bay Whale Watch, we had a watching killer whales, and they were checking out gray whales that swam upside down next to each other, holding flippers for reinforcement. And then they came across a juvenile blue whale, and one killer whale grabbed its flukes, and the blue whale was surfacing and actually threw the killer whale off, and it made the killer whale cartwheel. It went down and came up half a mile away, took one breath, went down and came up half a mile away, and the killer whales didn't pursue it. So 
I don't know if they were playing, you know, tag your it or something, but the, killer, the uh, blue whale is actually bleeding from the tip of the flukes. So I don't think they were serious about that because they didn't go after it. It wasn't a calf. And more recently, May 2017, there were 12 at least killer whales that rushed a blue whale. They just suddenly just raced up to it, and this blue whale was minding its own business and surface, and it took off very, very fast, and the killer whales didn't chase it. In Mexico back in uh, 1977, uh, um, they chased a blue whale calf and were attacking it for five hours. Again, different killer whales. They did not confirm a fatality. The, they left it, but most likely it didn't survive because of the seriousness of the uh, bites. 2003, they were seen feeding on a recently killed blue whale, but nobody had confirmed any killer whales killing a blue whale and published it until last week. Okay, when you, how many of you have heard of the blue whales that were attacked off of Australia and Bremer Canyon? So there was actually two attacks in 2019 and one attack in 2021 that was witnessed by a lot of people, documented and just published on it. So people are wondering, what, this new behavior? I don't think it's a new behavior because we've been seeing kill, uh, blue whales with tooth rakes on them for years. But this was actually with people in the right place when it, this was happening. So you can go online anywhere and be reading about this. They actually were going inside the mouths of the blue whales when the blue whales were still alive, eating their tongue, which is considered to be the most delicate part. There's no hard bone and lots of nutrients there. As many as um, 50, 75 killer whales. So transient killer whales ambush their prey. They cooperate. They teach the young ones how to fight and how to um, fight for their food, how to go after it. Kill time can be up to two hours, and they have a, take a longer time if they have young ones with them. For example, this is a fat fin, who is a young male, really fat fin, has a really triangular fin as a baby, so I named him Fat Fin. Who's that funny looking kid with the fat fin? He looked just like his mom. She had a really fat fin too. And there he is at age uh, eight or 10, throwing a sea lion around. He played with his food for like an hour and then didn't eat it. And he's also put it on his back and showed the boat, people on the boat the food, showing off his food like, you want some of this? Oh, this one's not changing here. So looking up here, uh, they target elephant seals and sea lions. They leap on top of them to stun them. They ram them. Um, they throw them in the air. And over in the lower right, there's two killer whale calves carrying flippers in their mouth for an hour. Well, I was working on a NOAA ship for six weeks, and on my day off, of course, I went whale watching <laughs> up in British Columbia, and I was out and got to see a killer whale launch a um, harbor seal up about 80 feet in the air. And that's a pretty famous event, and just happened to be there to get to see that. It was very exciting. Uh, the harbor seal's eyes were open, and it went above the birds, was looking at the birds, and then it came down and hit the water. It was like hitting a cement wall, so it did not survive. But uh, that, was, that was crazy. So that's one of their techniques of going after their prey. And up in Monterey, um, killer whale going after also harbor seal and then carrying it in teeth. And white-sided dolphin, that's one of their favorite foods up there. Usually eat them pretty quick. Also, uh, doll's porpoise, really tough. We don't see many of them here. They're very, very fast. And so they chase after them, but they can catch up with them, and then they'll eat those too. But probably the most common things are California sea lion. It's the most common year round. They also will go after birds. They chase birds, probably the prey, but this day we saw them eat uh, five birds, go play with the bird. I don't think the bird liked that game. They play with it till it drowned, and it wouldn't be fun anymore. So they go after another one. But it is a way for young ones to practice like hitting things and throwing things, which they need to do as an adult. And also they played this kick to salmon. This was a new one since transients don't eat salmon. They were kicking this live fish way in the air and throwing it way in the air. Our videographer happened to have a drone up at the time and got a picture of the fish that almost hit the drone. And it hit the water, it did not die, and they left it alone. They didn't eat it. They were just playing with it. Crazy. You can go on Monterey Bay Whale Watch and look that up. That video is crazy. So they go after gray whales seasonally, not so much the southbound, although they have attacked them southbound. There was an attack last year of a southbound calf in Monterey. 
We're seeing southbound calves going by right now, but they wait till the calves typically are larger before going after them. They forage along the canyon wall, Monterey Bay. They go back and forth along the edges of the canyon. That's where gray whales will lots of times take a shortcut, this deep water canyon in Monterey, like we have a deep water canyon right off our coast here. So gray whales, over 20% of gray whales have killer whale tooth rakes. So we know they're targeted. And that could be either for a mom who is trying to defend her calf, or it could be a calf. Um, survive the, this one here, I'm gonna take this off. I'm, survive a killer whale attack, um, but then got killed in a gill net. So that one on the left is washed up at Point Furman and drowned in a gill net. The peak of the northbound migration, that's the best time to watch these uh, whales go by, is between the middle of April and the beginning of May, and that is the best time to see killer whales off our coast, where uh, dozens and sometimes over 100 could gather in Monterey Bay to go after gray whale calves. The reproductive females lead the attacks. They separate the calves, they ram them, and they try to drown them. So they have specific roles. And we see that a lot in Monterey Bay. On the bottom there is CA-140 uh, Emma. She's the most skilled gray whale hunter. She killed four calves in eight days. And then on the ninth day, she rested. They went after a calf, and they actually let it go. A decision was made. It's the first time I've ever seen one get away. So separating the calf, ramming the calf, drowning it. And it's the reproductive moms, the moms with kids who do this. And it's also learning lesson for their kids. The gray whale mom will try to hold her calf on her back and try to block the killer whales and hit them with their flukes. So off our area, these two females are notable because they both had at least six kids that we know of. The one on the left there has a brand new kid. Surprise me, I thought she was done. Her, her daughter was Comet, Comet's like 10 years old. She had another one, so she probably lost one in between. Probably it's her last calf. And CA-27, she's one of the ones who went up to Alaska and may well be the daughter of CA-54. Again, we don't know because she wasn't a calf when she was first seen. So off our area, this is the killer whales off our Point Vicente area where we are counting gray whales, and these guys came and they waited and ambushed a gray whale calf. So we're really excited to see gray whale calves. We're really excited to see the killer whales, and everybody was yelling, no, because we didn't want to see that happen. It's the only time it's been documented in all almost 40 years that we've been watching from there. And afterwards, they celebrate Bumper doing a big breach after eating some sea lions. So a big day, I'm going to go through very quickly, May 3rd, 2012, is when we had killer whales, attacked a gray whale and killed it, and happened to be filming with the BBC crew. And uh, at least 16 different humpback whales came in to try to interfere. So it was crazy. A uh, chop fin down there, he was in the area, but he just wasn't interested in gray whale at all. So he hasn't been involved in gray whale attacks. So Jagged, this female who has a couple of kids now, she was, she was eating that. And every time she, she leaned down to eat some of the gray whale calf, a humpback was, went over and went, woohoo! Like, what are you doing? Get away. For seven hours, the humpback whale stopped feeding and yelled at the killer whales and chased them around. And in some cases, it looked like they were trying to beat them up. It was insane. The killer whales cooperated, they attacked the calf, they grabbed onto it, they did all the things I talked about, ramming, pulling it down. The humpback whales were definitely upset. They make these angry trumpeting calls. They're chasing the killer whales around, they're splashing their flippers and their flukes at them. They definitely looked like they were trying to interfere. And after the calf was dead, they tried to interfere with them feeding on. So this is something that, a, bunch of scientists around the world led by Bob Pittman got together, compared their uh, encounters and came up with this paper with lots of different colleagues, humpback whales interfering with mammal eating killer whales. Is it mobbing behavior, altruism? What's going on? Are they the big bullies? Are they the protectors? Their kids get attacked too. And some of the, killer, the uh, humpback whales had killer whale tooth marks on them. Then there was a case we had in 2018, first time I've ever seen it, they attacked a gray whale calf and killed it, and the next day, the killer whales were still there, and a couple of humpback whales were there, and they were checking out the dead gray whale calf. They were checking it out like an elephant checks out a dead friend or family member, slowly touching it and moving very slowly around it. Never seen anything like that. 
It's really amazing. Humpback was touching the calf and leaning over and looking at it. And again, it's a, deaf, a uh, dead uh, gray whale calf, and the killer whales had left at this point. So CA-51 again, the queen of the area here. And uh, here is her family, and you can't quite... Okay, can you guys? Yes, you can. Nope, you can't see. There's one. Wait a sec. Back up here. That's one I was hoping it would show, but it doesn't quite show there. So CA-51 is the matriarch, born in 1979. And she has uh, five kids there. There is one that I had put right here, but it doesn't quite show. Um, CA-51F, um, little nebula, was born this last year, within the last year. And we've got CA-54A4 Eclipse, who was also born within this last year. So they're, they're um, like uncle and, and little kid hanging out together. Whole family, we've got Dipper Andy. This one died at about six years old, seemed healthy. We saw a month before it disappeared. So big healthy uh, family here and all age ranges. So they're the ones, again, you'd most likely see the friendly pod. So coming up close to boats, checking them out. And right here is a, sorry about that. This is a greeting ceremony that I've seen only this family do. When they line up, it used to be seven of them with Comet in the middle. They'd approach a boat and stop, look up at the people and go, It's crazy. And she did that at least five different occasions. And it's the same thing. And they will do greeting ceremony in some places with each other. But it's the first time we'd seen it with a boat. So I'm going to play a couple of things here. One is um, uh, uh, Ryan and Bumper to the two brothers. And they're actually sharing food. So Ryan, the big brother, brought sea lion to Bumper, the younger brother. And they shared food. We could hear it at the surface. So he's pushing the sea lion, and, and Bumper's pushing, it was going, they were going like a ritual toward each other like this, vocalizing at the surface and then passing it on. Then this one I want to play. That's Andy sticking her head up, looking at the people on the boat and making like a raspberry. This is one of my favorites. This is Bumper, and he often vocalizes and often touches boats, and I named him Bumper because he bumped my boat three different times, like a little hello, not a big slam. Yeah, my friend Eric Martin, he, um, he had a video that this is on. You can, three men in a bathtub in his eight-foot boat when they came up to his boat. It was crazy, crazy good stuff. This family is amazing. And there's a lot of amazing killer whales, but they're my favorite. And that right there is that day this happened when Bumper is right next to his little so-called boat. And there's Bumper checking him out. Comet laying on her mom's head when she was one year old. And the family here. And then spy hopping, which I'd shown you before. And this is uh, the whole family. And I told the story about, well, Bumper was up, he was up in Diablo Canyon. There were bird watchers. Suddenly the captain said, there's something big under the boat. Something really big under the boat. It's the size of a whale. They didn't know there were killer whales there. Bumper popped up next to the boat, looked at the bird watchers, put water in his flukes, and threw it at the bird watchers. <laughs> threw it at them. And then he stopped and just stuck out his head and looked at him. So I told a friend who told a cartoonist who made this cartoon, a witness reported you were deliberately splashing the deck of a whale watching boat. I'm going to have to issue you a cetacean. <laughs> Cetaceans are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So that's kind of fun. A little bumper story. This is a time when Bumper grabbed a common dolphin in the rain, and all four whales at that time, four whales raced to our boat and stopped, and Bumper bumped the dolphin up against the boat in the rain. 
we think they do, again, come to this area to go after those common dolphin. Common dolphin try to get away. There's, again, so many of them here. And off here, again, right by Point Vicente, the family of uh, the daughter, Aurora, and celebrating after a common dolphin kill, right off our area. In Monterey, in, um, these are in 2019, had a few new calves and uh, getting to see some other families, along with uh, CA21, who's an older female, is hanging out with uh, 169, their close associates, and Bumper the orphan who was adopted by CA-138 when he was just a little funny little kid with a fat fin. There is little Nebula with big brother uh, Orion, and there's little Eclipse with Mom Aurora, and this was just taken last April, and they're doing a little cuddle puddle here with the calf cuddling Mom, just hugging her with the whole body. Really special. It was in April after a killer whale attack. This is Fat Finn, picture when he was a baby, about four years old, and then a couple of years ago off this area. He's a very sociable uh, whale. Then his fin got tall and skinny, and I got worried, and then it filled out again, because Fat Finn wasn't going to work with a tall, skinny fin. Exotic, sometimes we get killer whales now, particularly in the last several years, we've been getting killer whales from Washington. We're seeing that more and more, and we don't know quite why, but we're whales, CA. 40 and 137 to the captain for 15 minutes. And we approached and he was kind of excited because I was on the boat, maybe it's exotics from California. And it turned out it was the ones I was talking about, the same whales out of all those 200 plus whales. That was super exciting to see them off San Juan Island mixed with transients up there. And here's some more transients that have been seen, San Nicolas Island, Monterey, and Puget Sound. Only been seen a handful of times. Unknown type killer whales can go after uh, the sperm whale, again, with these cookie cutter shark bites. And sperm whales will go in this rosette pattern and protect the calves in the middle. 50, up to 50 killer whales. It started with nine, then 25, then 30, then 50 killer whales attacked nine sperm whales and did kill a couple of them. Off of Morro Bay was over 50 miles offshore. They've also been known to prey on Riso's dolphin. This was in 2005 in Monterey Bay with, again, Monterey Bay Whale Watch, which is the company that uh, the California Killer Whale Project works with. This is October 2019. This whale, these whales went after a fin whale, and they went after this year rhesus dolphin. And uh, this has been from 2005, and this whale is a whale from way off that was going after some other mammals. Really odd-looking, narrow saddles. We don't know the relationships to the other whales, but super interesting and exciting. So resident killer whales, the ones that might be seen in California, are the southern residents. Those are the ones that are highly endangered. They're in clans, pods, and have matrilines. You have matriline, which is a family, goes together in a pod and a clan, and the whole thing is called a population. They travel down to California, likely a historical feeding area, going for salmon. Why aren't they here? We don't have salmon. They're all about the salmon. Wish we had salmon. Uh, January 2020 is the first time we confirmed them in California. Very exciting. Most winters since 2003, they took off a few years and they weren't seen here. The last time was March 31st, 2019, seven days before I got up to Monterey. So I haven't been able to see them up in Monterey, but I've seen them up in Puget Sound. They, uh, many of them have open saddles. They're often very uh, active. This particular day, 2008, uh, we saw K-pod and L-pod. We haven't confirmed J-pod yet. That's, those are the ones that you very often used to see around San Juan Island. So the decline in their primary prey, degraded habitat with boat traffic and sonar and fishery interactions, not enough salmon, high mortality with toxins, and low calf survival. So several killer whales were pregnant this last year, and we have not seen any new babies. So they most likely lost them. We might be still have a couple who may still be pregnant but there's very high mortality with those calves. The offshore killer whales are our shark eaters. We can see them here. Seen them first time ever seen in California. I saw them up in uh, Monterey with um, Nancy and Richard, and we had them 1992. So the ones that had the longest uh, match here, this is uh, 087 and 0231, her daughter. We first saw her in 1992 on that very first 
encounter in Monterey Bay, and they were here November 12th, 2021, both of them, but now there's some grandbabies, along with 80 to 100 offshore killer whales. We're spread out, Monterey Bay, it was crazy. So this is um, that whale this year, and this whale is the first time we've ever seen it. So some whales will be new to us, and many of them are ones we've seen before. That's always exciting when we get to see them, very, very rare. And their teeth are different. Offshore killer whales, they eat sharks, their teeth are all worn down. Residents eat fish, they're not so worn, and transients eat mammals, and they're, they're very hard for biting, piercing the prey. But their teeth could be worn all the way to the gums. Comparison with, a, with the uh, skull, transients, teeth, pointy, these guys all worn down, even all the way down. Offshore killer whales, again in California, I spotted them, I told you about the sighting when we had about 100 out here. This particular whale was seen in 2016 right off this area, and they like to lobtail a lot. They're smaller, and the male's fins don't get nearly as big. And this one here, this is um, just showing an activity that sometimes you can have, which remind me, you can have transients and a different ecotype in the bay at the same time, like transients and offshores, or transients and residents, but we have never seen them ever mix with any other group. This one is breaching on top of a, a sea lion. And here's a few of them. Open saddle, this is a uh, rare open saddle with the offshore killer whales. This one is likely the mother of the one I showed you before with the scoop in the middle. They're still together. He's still around. This one is still with his mom as of a couple years ago. His mom was seen from shore in uh, Big Sur just a couple years ago. Some of these whales are quite old. Okay, here they are in Monterey Bay in 2003. Gray whales are mating with like everything, like everything was showing and killer whales were with them for 45 minutes. And the gray whales weren't concerned because they don't eat gray whale. Offshore killer whales, December 13th, were feeding on seven gill shark in Monterey. It's the first time that's been documented in a, so super exciting, the uh, uh, opa, moonfish. And they've also eat halibut and they eat sleeper shark. So first documentation because of drone technology, which is a fabulous way to study behavior. Well, that was pretty cool, but several days later, we saw offshore killer whale, and she was nursing her calf the same time she was carrying blue shark to go on her pectoral flipper. We would have never known that if we didn't have a drone up. Really special. None of the offshore killer whales has nicknames, but I nicknamed this one anyway, Scoop Fin, who's been around for a long, long time. It's got about the biggest fin in the offshore population. And that was the first time blue shark's been confirmed in California. I put out orca alerts. We try to let people know when the whales are out there so as many people could enjoy as possible with good whale watching. Um, habits are scoop fin out here. And this photograph was taken by the uh, staff or uh, interns here at the aquarium. And right here is that male that I told you about, uh, CA216 right here, which is, has a little scoop in the middle with his probable mom. And here is the daughter of 087, 0231 is there. So caught some good whales. Spread out all over the place. December 2nd, 2021, we had four offshore killer whales here. How many people heard about that? That was very exciting. It was like, who are these whales? And I was thinking, oh boy, I think I've seen that whale before. It has a real open saddle, very unusual and uh, identified as 0104 by Graham Ellis, who is the world's expert on offshore killer whales. And so I was looking through my pictures, and uh, they've seen her back uh, quite a long time, most recently 2015, and I did definitely match that whale, 2001, right here, uh, right off the Los Angeles area, right outside the harbor. So that was very exciting. And she's with uh, her juveniles and her son. So we've seen them over quite a few years. LA pod, I talked about briefly, this is the, the whale that ate jaws right there. This is Notchfin, CA1, he's our first killer whale cataloged. And this whale actually had two wounds through here that I think were gunshots. And they attacked and ate a great white shark. There she is right there, 
She has a funny looking eye patch with a birthmark. The only whale that I've ever seen has a birthmark there, which was really handy when I saw her on TV. Someone called me and said, you got to turn on the TV. Somebody just ate a great white shark up in the Farallon Islands. And I figured it would be, you know, some big old hefty other kind of whale, and it was our whales. Also, this is a gray whale barnacle, and it's on a killer whale calf. The only places they've been seen not gray whale was on a beluga in San Diego and on this killer whale calf that got caught in a gill net and died off Bolsa Chica in 2000, uh, in a, let's see, 1980, 1985. Marineland of the Pacific is where we were first seeing them. Right off here, there's CA2, the one who uh, ate the great white. This is CA3, who's eating a shark right off Orange County. And this is me going out with my friend Eric Martin, who was in that little rubber boat before. Not afraid because he knew, you know, it's Bumper. Bumper was doing his thing and watching the LA pod. And eating, that's what the great white looks like. And there she is. Last seen, December 3rd, 1997. And there she is right after the attack and all her skin is rubbed off here from smashing that shark. Off of South Africa, they have two whales, port and starboard. Starboard's fin tips to the right, port's fin tips to the left. And it's a male pair. Some males, particularly those who have lost their moms, will hunt together. And they're hunting together off South Africa and they're taking out seven gill sharks and white sharks. And the other whites abandon the area. When they killed a great white in uh, 1997, all the sharks left for that season. It was in the middle of shark season. Great whites, they all left. In 2000, it happened again. One was tagged, and it swam all the way to almost Hawaii without stopping within the hour of the attack. So they, they know something's going on. So it's really interesting. They also eat copper sharks and seven gills there. And that's still happening. Surgically remove the liver which is really high in fat. Killer whales of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. There's 195 in a catalog published by NOAA. We have gotten them here most often December and January, November, December, January, I'd say. They tend to have dark saddles, very dark saddles, and have these barnacles hanging off them. So one had a no dorsal fin. As a calf, it was, we think it was bitten off, possibly by a shark. They went into Newport Bay they went underneath the pier. They checked out a gray whale. Gray whale hid under the pier. Didn't get eaten. A sea lion surfaced, surfed onto the beach in front of a jogger, almost knocked the jogger over, trying to get away from the killer whales that were in Newport Beach Harbor, Newport Harbor. Okay, so this particular whale, uh, E261, um, has been seen multiple times, 2006, 2009. Lots of sightings of that particular distinctive whale. Mysterious Mel, this was a killer whale who hung out with dolphin. He swam with dolphin for a couple of years. So that was pretty exciting and different. And they looked like they played tag a few times, but the dolphin never got eaten. We'd, they'd actually go and look for big groups of dolphin to find this killer whale in the middle of them, an immature male. And then we heard on the radio one day that he was out there, a boat said he got a killer whale in a net. And then there was radio silence, and he was never seen again, the killer whale. So we're hoping he didn't get caught. It wasn't him. But 2014, we had lots of uh, ETPs here. And again, we, they're not a particular. There's multiple ecotypes within this group of killer whales from San Diego to Peru. We're still learning a lot about them. They often are boat friendly. They'll ride the wake. They turn over on their sides and look at you. Very exciting. Up in Santa Barbara is the furthest north, and this was in 2014. Saw them right out here. Dolphin didn't know what was going on. They just took off, and that was smart, because these guys eat dolphin a lot, a lot, multiple dolphin. One group took out like 10 dolphin in a day, different members, and then for 90 seconds, they breached like crazy. This particular one's really interesting, ME45. Uh, called Moctezuma, pretty famous down in Mexico. Actually, saw, I saw him here in 2017. And then he was seen in Cabo uh, San Lucas 2017, the next month. He was seen in 2002 off Newport Beach. And he was seen May 2021, La Paz. So he's very famous. And people are making like documentaries about him and his group. It's very distinctive dorsal fin. 
dolphin predation. They're going after dolphin here, and the dolphin are going, okay, time to leave. This is 2018. Some do have very light saddles like Mel. So how can you study them? One is by biopsy, taking a biopsy. Where, uh, Nancy had uh, Black here had a uh, permit to collect biopsy samples. This is Liner, a really interesting male who has a black line in his right eye patch like a birthmark. And he is our only male who left his mom. And he left his mom to be with who we think is probably his niece when she had her first baby when she was really young. And he hung out with her for years. So he doesn't always travel with his mom and it's in our only case. Up in British Columbia that happens often, uh, somewhat often with a second son. Uh, not common, but occasionally. But he's our only one. And also he got uh, entangled for about 10 minutes or so in a crab trap line and disentangled himself. So that can be a problem. One way to study them is by using uh, tags, but these are invasive tags, and that project's been stopped since one whale was tagged and it got an infection, a fungus infection, and died. And it was one of the endangered southern residents. But there are suction cup tags people use now that are non-invasive, where you can get a lot of information from them, put a camera on them. This is uh, CA27 um, family, CA27B. She had a tag in here. And uh, you could still see the tag several months later, but then it completely came loose and she's fine and has kids. And O215, he was tagged and there were two different whales and offshores tagged. One went north, one went south, and they went around San Clemente Island and down into Mexico and back. They traveled quite a distance. So some threats are entanglement, but you gotta know people call in, they see a sea lion, they like to wrap an intestine around themselves. People say, oh my God, goodness, the killer whale's entangled in intestine, he's playing with his food. But we get calls often about the poor killer whale who's entangled. So going, checking out inquisitive, checking out these um, crab trap pots and going swimming right by it, sometimes playing push the pot. This is a calf who had an entanglement and was not currently entangled, but definitely had an entanglement, went all the way around the calf. This one, they like to play with kelp. It's called kelping. And some people think, oh no, it's entangled. But it did that on purpose. I've seen just about every cetacean species do that. So within sampling, we can find out, look at the pollutant levels, persistent organic pollutants, PCBs, DDTs off California. There's a lot, a lot of fire retardant. And that stuff is really, really bad for the animals in the water. It can affect their immunity, possibly cause miscarriages. is isn't good for people either. Gets in the, the um, ecosystem and gets built up. The further up you go, the more you're ingesting, like in sofas, clothing. It bioaccumulates and is a real problem for the top predators. Persistent organic pollutants, POPs. And it's so bad that we, there's actually a California signature when you take a biopsy sample and you don't know which one is from California, you can look at the biopsy sample and know this is a whale that's fed in California because of that high level of pollution, which is not a good a, a claim to have. And the offspring get it from their mom. The first kid gets a lot of it because the mother is getting rid of those pollutants. The second kid, not so much. By the third kid, she's pretty much cleaned out her blubber um, storage area for pollutants. Males can't get rid of their pollutants because they're not nursing. With humans, we get rid of some um, uh, pollutants, but these guys, like women who eat a lot of the uh, seal blubber up north, can have very high level of these pollutants. So a mom, the first kid, pollutant level's very, very high. By the second kid, it's much lower, and by the third, it's pretty clean uh, milk. U.S. has the toughest standards to help protect from fire. And if you were to sample, get sampled, you would find out that you probably have a fair uh, levels of the, this retardant. And they're talking about banning it in California, which is tough because we have such fire problems. So just looking off of California, you could see uh, the issues with PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which you get in electrical transformers off California. It's a high amount. Take a look at the DDTs off the chart. Montrose Chemical Plant in Torrance, they dump DDT right off our coast. There's a ship that dumped barrels of DDT out by Catalina Island and the barrels wouldn't sink so they shot holes in it to make it sink. And the DDT floated out and went to Catalina Island and got into the ecosystem and got into the fish that got into the bald eagles whose eggshells were so thin they'd sit on them and they'd break and we lost bald eagles off Catalina. 
and it's still leaking on the bottom. They're still leaking. 16s for Jagged's group. There's several, including some real interesting ones. This is called Frosty. Frosty is leucistic, not albino. Very pale when born. Uh, there's one just like Frosty up in British Columbia, but didn't survive. We're hoping Frosty doesn't have any kind of a, um, a disorder, genetic disorder. This is what Frosty looks like now. Okay, very white, but the head's turning darker and darker. Looks very, very healthy. So it's our local super interesting whale that we have seen right off here. Quick little story about this. I was up in British Columbia with my friend Eric. Really wanted a picture of a breaching killer whale. They always breach when I wasn't looking. So I pictured a whale breaching over and over and over and over just for fun. It was my friend's birthday, so I told him to do it too. And I focused on a certain spot and I kept playing a little reel in my head because why not? And the whales were sleeping over there. And suddenly a whale launched itself out of the water exactly where I was focused, exactly in the position that I was playing in my head. Took a picture straight up, got it one as it was coming down, ducked down because the boat got completely wet and then she went back to sleep like, get out of my head, leave me alone. I can't explain it, but it happened. I wouldn't have gotten that picture, so there's, Magic kind of still happens, and it's very inspiring. Some things you can't explain, you just got to take it and be happy for it and grateful for it. Sunset on the water with killer whales, about as good as it gets. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Oh, before you, I don't want to forget to do this. You know that greeting ceremony? One more time. I want you to hear Bumper one more time. When you get a killer whale looking you in the eye, holding its head up, staring at you, and vocalizing, super special. I'm a big fan of your work, so it's, this lecture has been really great, so thank you for this. Um, I did have a question about the southern resident killer whale. Is the reason that they're, the Chinook salmon, they don't have access to it, is it because of the dam? Or? We believe that if the dams are taken down, it will allow the salmon to go up and reproduce because they need to go up those, those uh, waterways. That's what they're used to doing. And, so there's a big push to tear down like the snake dam, to tear down several of the dams, which would give the salmon an opportunity to reproduce. Um, is there a way of getting Chinook salmon to just exist if it's like really difficult to break down the dams, whether it be legal reasons or so, um, is through like means of like aquaculture or would that disturb the natural ecosystem? It, that's a really good question and actually we know that Farm salmon is not good for them at all. There was a farm that was breached. It fell apart and the salmon escaped and they have parasites and they, the babies outcompete and it was, not, it was a disaster. So that's something we thought, wouldn't that be great if we could do that and it just isn't viable. So we need to bring back the salmon which is used to living here and thrives here. They need to, in my opinion, they need to be able to get back to where they reproduce. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't do the tagging. The folks who do the biopsies uh, have the permits to do them. Sometimes it's with a, like a bow and arrow. Um, there's another way of taking it. You know, there's a, that's, that's one way. One's with like a, a gun looking thing. One's with a, when I, the ship that I was on, they did bow and arrow. And then it takes a little plug of skin and blubber out. And then you retrieve that. And then you do send it away for analysis. You've got to properly store it and all of that. 
So it doesn't, most, in many cases, we were recording their reactions. In most cases, they didn't react. Some whales would, you know, make a little flick. But they, again, the uh, limpet tagging is not being done on the killer whales. It's the shorter term tagging, like the uh, suction cup tag. It's a big thing now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you put it on a big pole and go along like this, and you have a good boat driver. And you're waiting, 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 and then like tag your it with a long pole. Yes. Um, for the milk pollutants that you were measuring, how large they were, and then for the second um, calf, how much smaller they were, um, how did you figure that out? Did, did it have to do with the fat in the milk, letting it float so you could make a... Well, I, that wasn't, yeah, that? that's a good question. I was on the boat where that was collected, but we didn't do the analysis. Uh, Nancy Black had done the, the collection of it, and then we sent it away to a lab, and they did that. So I'm not on that end of it. So they have to basically break it down and look at all the different components, look at fatty acids and so on. I just wondered in the, in the ocean. Yeah, in the ocean, no. For the ocean, we're just collecting the, just the sample and then and properly storing it, like have a little cooler, and you, you can't have it, you can't, uh, you have to, certain protocols you have to follow for it, or otherwise it's no good. I think we have time for one or two more, so. Right here, do we have a mic? Can you hear me? Okay, there we there go. We go. <laughs> um, I have two questions, uh, two part questions about the um, the dorsal fins. Um, first of all, because you showed a couple pictures of one, um, some of the whales that had gotten them cut off. Does that affect them or put them at a disadvantage in any way? And my second question is, um, is there a reason why some of them like? fall, like the dorsal fins cur curl over, and uh, why does that happen? Very good questions. Um, the, we've only had a couple whales documented, a few whales. There's one offshore, there's that one HEP calf, um, and there's Chopfin, who isn't around now, and uh, one of our other females. There's only been a handful of whales that we have here and some more in Mexico that had lost their fins doesn't seem to be any problem at all. The dorsal fin is a great way to get rid of extra heat, but females have much smaller fins. You know, they could still get rid of the heat. It's, it's fine. They can do it through their flippers too. Uh, bumper, and people would make, I've had people say, look, his fin is curved. Why are you saying that all whales in the wild have straight fins? And, pe and whales in captivity are bent fins when you have a bent fin right there. Okay, the only one whose fin was completely bent was chop fin when he got entangled and it cut off the circulation here and his fin flopped over and actually went flat like a pancake. And then as it rotted away basically, necrotic tissue, it was able to straighten up but he only had half a fin by the time that was done and then it was run over like that. Uh, the, that didn't seem to bother him at all, he was fine. In captivity, the whale's sitting on top of the surface a good deal of the time, and there's a lot of different reasons we think it might collapse, it's dorsal fin collapse in captivity. Uh, could be stress-related, is part of it. It doesn't mean the whale is sad. People say, oh, obviously it's sad because it's frowning, like its fin is like this. No, 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 no. Um, but that, it could be the repetitive swimming. You know, it could be, there's a lot of different factors, but um, every male in captivity's fin collapses as they get old, and females don't, and we don't, just don't see that in the wild. I mean, Bumper, even at his two-year-old, his fin was like this. And when his fin grew, it became like this. And now, a lot of older males, their fin is a little bit wavy. We have several males with a wavy fin. So it's a definite thing related to captivity. It doesn't have to do specifically with like being sad or happy or anything like that. Well, at least... Elisa, thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. We're going to go ahead and move towards our social hour and cocktail hour out in the main gallery. 
Um, we wanted to take a moment to remind that our next first Wednesday's event will be on March 2nd, and the topic will be oil rigs and reefs. And please continue to check the website for additional information. Um, thanks again to our volunteers for helping with our question and answers, and, and thank you. And looking forward to visiting more out in the gallery. And if any of you didn't get a chance to ask any questions, I'll be happy to take whatever questions you've got to throw at me. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.